Hey everybody, it's Art from AKA Web Design, and today we are talking about cross-site scripting. For those of you who might not be aware, cross-site scripting is a dangerous attack on a web application that can do any number of things. It can access the data in your browser as you're interacting with that web application, things like your cookies or your local storage. They can transmit sensitive data to an attacker, things like the keys that you're typing or the parts of the screen that you're clicking on. They can even redirect you from the application you're trying to use to a page that looks just like it in hopes that it can steal your credentials and send that to the attacker. Cross-site scripting attacks are simple in theory. They allow an attacker to execute JavaScript within the context of a web application. But under the hood, there's three different flavors of cross-site scripting attacks that we're going to dive into. The three kinds of cross-site scripting attacks you need to be familiar with are reflected, stored, or sometimes called persistent, and DOM-based. Reflected cross-site scripting attacks involve a malicious payload, which is returned embedded within the HTML, which is coming from the web server you're trying to view. In the example here on the screen, you can see that we visited a page which takes a search term as part of the URL. The web server is taking that malicious payload and embedding it as if it was HTML written on the server and returning that to the client requesting the page. This malicious script could do any number of things as indicated here in the slide. It could redirect us to a phishing page. It could inspect our cookies or our local data, or it could even log the keys that we type on the page and send those back to the attacker. So what you can see in a reflected cross-site scripting attack is that this attack gets its name like a mirror, that it's reflecting the input the application is given back to the user as part of the HTML. Stored cross-site scripting attacks are very similar to reflected cross-site scripting attacks in that the malicious payload is reflected back to the user in the HTML which is returned from the server. The core difference between a stored attack and a reflected attack is that in a stored cross-site scripting attack, that malicious payload is stored in a database and it can get there by any number of mechanisms. For example, a malicious user might try to input a cross-site scripting attack into a comment field on somebody's blog or as a product review on some sort of online store. The result of these attacks is the same. You might be redirected to some other page or the data or the inputs that you're providing to the application can be exfiltrated to the attacker. One key difference to consider when looking for reflected versus stored cross-site scripting attacks is the number of users who could potentially be impacted by such an attack. Because a stored cross-site scripting attack is persisting its malicious payload in a database, it's definitely more likely to impact a greater number of users because that attack payload may come out of the database at any time as any number of users interact with the application. Whereas a reflected cross-site scripting attack is likely to impact a smaller number of users because they have to be directed specifically to that point of attack. The third and final kind of cross-site scripting attack to learn is called the DOM-based attack. This is a hybrid attack combining attributes of a reflected cross-site scripting attack as well as a stored cross-site scripting attack depending on how the attack is executed. The important difference between a DOM-based and reflected or stored cross-site scripting attacks is that DOM-based attacks do not change the HTML that is returned from the server to the client's browser. The attack payload can be injected into the browser as a result of the HTML templating that typically occurs in modern JavaScript libraries, things like React, Angular, Vue.js, and any other number of libraries that the application might use. 
That attack payload might exist in the database and be retrieved as a result of an API request that the application makes. On the other hand, the attack payload might also be present in something like one of the URL query parameters, which could be injected to the HTML templating system at runtime by the application. The end result is the same as the prior two kinds of cross-site scripting attacks. The attacker might redirect you to a new page, might exfiltrate your data or log, your keystrokes, or how you interact with the application. Now that we're familiar with the three different kinds of cross-site scripting attacks, let's take a look at two examples that you might already be familiar with that'll give you a better understanding of just how dangerous cross-site scripting attacks can be. The first example we have is referred to as SAMI, sometimes called JS Space Hero, or more commonly referred to as the MySpace worm. This attack happened in October of 2005 when MySpace was at the height of the social media revolution. Within 20 hours of its release, more than 1 million users had been affected, which makes SAMI one of the fastest spreading viruses of all time. The cross-site scripting payload itself was relatively harmless. Its purpose was to give Sammy, who's the author of the worm, more friends on the MySpace platform. The attack payload was a JavaScript injection which occurred because MySpace did not properly sanitize the input fields when a user would edit their profile. So anybody viewing Sammy's profile would automatically have this code run in their browser, which would then add them as a friend of Sammy's, go through their own friend list, and add all of those friends as Sammy's friends. The result of the MySpace worm led to Sammy being pursued by the FBI, where he had to pay thousands of dollars in restitution, as well as performing community service. It's a lesson learned to all you kids out there Cross-site scripting is not a joke. Another famous cross-site scripting attack happened to eBay in 2014, in which attackers were able to embed malicious JavaScript in the listing for items being sold on the eBay site. That malicious JavaScript would redirect users to a login page that looked just like the eBay login page. The idea here is that unwitting users would attempt to log in on this spoofed login page, giving the attacker their eBay credentials. They would then be redirected back to the eBay website, not knowing that they had just given the attacker their credentials, and now their entire eBay account was compromised. Now that we understand what cross-site scripting attacks are, and we've seen some examples of even big companies who've become victims of such attacks. It's really important that you learn how to protect yourself against cross-site scripting attacks in your own applications. If you're not already familiar with the OWASP Top 10, it's definitely a resource that I'd recommend you read more deeply about. Cross-site scripting is one of the top 10 most common vulnerabilities that web applications are susceptible to. And there are a variety of tools that exist, both free and paid, that can make your life much easier to automate protecting against attacks like cross-site scripting. Tools like OWASP Zap or Burp Suite can be automated in your CI CD pipelines to do what's called dynamic application security testing. So that as your application gets built into a test environment, you can automate the process of checking for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities across all the pages in your application. Furthermore, you should deepen your efforts for all kinds of input sanitation and validation, both for inputs being received from the user, as well as information that comes back from the server before you inject it into your HTML templates. Last but not least, you should definitely look into using a web application firewall which can prevent many of the most common cross-site scripting attack vectors. 
I hope this video has been helpful for you to learn more about cross-site scripting and the different variations of attacks that might exist. Thanks for watching. I hope I'll see you next time. Thank you.